Welcome back. In a previous section, we explored how we can compose simple functions to solve more complex tasks. Now we will expand on that, and this will lead us to neural networks and finally to deep learning. Before we go into the details of neural networks, let's ask ourselves why we would actually need more complex functions. Because maybe what I told you about in the previous section was just a problem that I constructed very arbitrarily and has nothing to do with the real world. Let's, for example, say we want to recognize cats. How could we do that without using something very elaborate, with just using the simple linear classifier that we defined before and with some handcrafted features? Let's say we can come up with some features and we have a way to identify whether these features are present in a given image. And then we say and train a classifier that given these features are present in an image, it will say the image is a cat or the image shows a cat. Well, what features can we look at? First, let's say we're looking at sharp ears. These are very common for cats, so let's say this is a feature of a cat. Another feature would be to have fur, to have paws, and also to have whiskers. That's something very useful and something we could say, okay, every cat that we want to look at has this. Let's test our classifier on another cat then. This cat here, we can pass into our classifier. We can say, okay, does it have sharp ears? Yes, it does. Does it have whiskers? Yes, it does. It also has fur, it has paws. All right, our classifier will say, this is a cat. Now, what happens if I show you another picture? What about this cat? Well, our classifier will say, it has sharp ears, yes. Does not have whiskers, does not have fur, does have paws though. However, our classifier is very limited and can only decide whether it is a cat or not based on the features that we defined. And the features say it's not a cat. So our classifier doesn't recognize this as a cat, though this is a cat. But this is a problem. And how do we deal with this? Well, our handcrafted features will not get us that far. We need something that recognizes cats like this reliably. We need more complex functions and we need to learn features from data. And still, even if we learn features from data, it might not pick up that this is a cat. It only needs, learns that if something like that is also in the training data. So we need lots of data. Fortunately, there are larger data sets available. One example would be the ImageNet data set, where we have 1.2 million images that are all labeled and they all show different objects in them. So each image has a different object and these are labeled across 1000 different abstract categories and uh, therefore we can train a classifier to classify the image for the object it shows. And there's a yearly contest held uh, since 2010 to find the best such classifier. Let's take a look at the results for the ImageNet competition. The human performance is around 5%. That was achieved by a graduate student who sat down and just tested himself on the ImageNet test set. In 2011, the state of the art was above 25% error rate. And that was a huge gap to the human performance and achieved without neural networks. But then neural networks changed everything. AlexNet, which was the first neural network applied successfully to this task, shattered the previous state of the art and was um, miles better than everything that came before it. And through this success, deep neural networks became much more popular and everything afterwards was always won by deep neural networks. And finally, in 2015, deep neural networks achieved an error rate that was better than the original human performance. So I hope I could convince you that scaling up our model is actually the way to go. And we have seen in the previous section that this leads to more complex functions and allows us to model more complex, complex tasks. 
And now the t question is how much further can we do this by scaling it up? And for this, we take a step back and start at the beginning. Let's look at one neuron. This is something we've already seen in previous section as presented by Mohammed. We have two inputs, weights on each of these inputs, and then combine them with a sum and a bias. So we weight each input individually, add a bias, and then we apply nonlinearity, which we basically push into this um, circle here and treat as one unit of computation, and then we get the output out of this. All right, this is what we call a neuron. So it's basically just a linear classifier. And each neuron is inspired, of course, by the biological neurons. So what we have in our brain, those cells, they have the similar architecture that they accumulate inputs from all their surroundings. So multiple inputs are accumulated, weighted maybe, and then there is a threshold and above that threshold it would fire. And then it will pass that on to neighboring neurons that are connected um, to this neuron. And this is also where the similarity stops. So really biological neurons are much more complex than whatever we have here, but it is still the inspiration and helps us to understand the concept of all of this. Because now we first scale this up in the inputs, where we have not only two inputs, but d-dimensional inputs. So we have inputs x1 to xd, and since we scaled this up, we also need weights w1 to wd, and we add a bias. And that's it. Treat this exactly the same way as we would treat two inputs, we just add more weights based on how many inputs we have. Okay, this is multiple inputs, but we can also write this a little bit more simple. If we multiply a weight vector with the input vector. So if we treat both the input and the weights as a vector, so we have inputs x1 to xd and an additional constant input 1 in our input vector that is multiplied with the weight vector with weights w1 to wd and the bias in there. So the bias gets multiplied by the 1, so it's added just to everything else. This is exactly the same as the sum we've seen in the previous slide, but now it's just a bit more compact. And this will help us later if when the networks become more complex. So this was multiple inputs. What happens if we have multiple outputs? But now we also need multiple neurons. In this case, each neuron processes the same inputs in parallel, just with different weights. And here we have, for the example of output k, we have multiplied the kth weight vector with the inputs. And that means here for neuron 2, for example, that these connections are all separate from the other neurons and the other outputs and they process the same inputs as the others just in a different way and to generate the output of neuron 2. Now we don't need to consider each output separately but we can consider them as one vector and then all of this becomes a matrix vector product where we have a weight matrix that is multiplied to our input vector. Because of the way we deal with our weight matrix, we have one column for each input neuron that is multiplying the weight vector with the input vector and therefore getting us the output of an individual neuron. But all of this is just summarized as one vector. With multiple outputs, also the type of tasks that we can tackle changes drastically. Now we could do a regression problem where we can regress towards a vector. So here this is an example of bounding box regression, where for a given image as the input we need to predict four values, the x and the y position, as well as the width and the height of the bounding box for the tiger. So this gives us one vector as the output towards which we try to regress. 
That means we try to minimize the distance to the true output. Another example would be multi-class classification, where each output neuron represents one class probability. And here in this example, we want to classify an image to what object is shown in the image. And if we just consider what we had before, we will have an unscaled output, then this output doesn't make much sense to us. So it might be somewhere on the scale here, and it gives us some values, but they don't make much sense. What we want is something that tells us how high the percentage is that this image shows, for example, a tiger. So for the, to get this, we actually need to scale the output a bit. First, we apply an exponential function to the output. That means that all the values get higher, but the values that are larger than the others get scaled even higher. So the difference between the most the, the highest output and the next highest output gets larger, which is something that we actually want because then the network needs to put all its weight onto one class and needs to make a decision. This is something good. In addition, we also want to normalize this. That means we sum over all the outputs, so all the classes, and basically normalize by this sum. That means they will all sum up to one together. And this gives us what is called the softmax activation. And for each class, it's basically a probability of how likely the image shows this given class. And this we can use to basically say, okay, if we multiply these values by 100, this is with 25% certainty a tiger in this, car, in this image. And yeah, this is how multi-class classification works. Now let's take a look at the kind of neural network that we have. We have these different computations that are happening in parallel and that process the same inputs, just with different weights. So that means we want to summarize those units into one, what we call, layer. That's one unit of your computation, one layer. And all of this happens in parallel and can be described by one weight matrix. And that's our first neural network layer. Now, we can also describe this on a more higher level as one function that takes the vector x as input and predicts a new vector y. If we want to add a second layer, this is very simple. We just pass the output of our first layer into the second layer and have all the connections that we would have for a normal input and then the second layer predicts the output. So this is how this would look like on a more lower level where we have multiple units of computation that are happening in parallel and basically taking the previous layer's output uh, as the input with full connection to all the previous layer's neurons. This is how two layers of computation happen. And the first layer here would be what we call a hidden layer in a neural network because it has no connection, no direct connection to the output. Looking at the formula, this means we first apply the weight matrix of our first layer to the inputs, apply nonlinearity, then we have the output of our first layer. Nice. Second layer is then applying its own weight matrix that is distinct usually from the first layer's weight matrix to the output of the first layer. So we have a new weight matrix that basically treats the output of the first layer as its input and then basically yeah, applies the weights and finally applies the softmax to get class outputs. Okay, this is a two-layer neural network. This principle is very, very simple and is how neural networks are constructed. Now, how powerful is this? Is a single layer enough for us or do we need to add more? Well, Sivenko in 1989 
already said that a single hidden layer is sufficient for a neural network to approximate any continuous function. That means we could just scale the hidden layer to have enough capacity and then we are fine, right? Well, not quite because first of all, this is computationally expensive because the number of weights grows with the number of hidden units that we have. And the input size is also usually not too small. And it is hard to find weights that work in practice. And finally, it might not be the best idea also looking at our brain because the brain is not working with everything in parallel, but it has hierarchical structure. It processes layer wise um, the inputs. So we need to go deeper. That means just adding more hidden layers, which means we add a new layer that gets the previous layers outputs as its inputs and connects to the next layer. That's as simple as it is. We just repeat this process multiple times to stack more and more layers of computation. This is deep learning. These are deep neural networks. As soon as you add more than one hidden layer, basically going to a deep neural network. And that is it. With this, you can actually see that in ImageNet classification, the number of hidden layers starting from 2012 with the first CNN architecture applied on ImageNet, it rose quickly and in the end exploded with um, ResNet in 2015, which had more than 150 layers. So that was essentially the key to unlocking the potential of neural networks and allowing us to get some complex functions that can actually deal with these classification or these complex problems. Now, how do we train these things? First, let's recall how linear regression looked like. We specified a model, defined an objective, and then trained the model. Specifying the model is what we've just done. So we have our deep neural networks. We know how the individual layers compute its output and then hand it over to the next layer and so on. We know how this works. We have specified the model. Now we need to define an objective. If we look back at how linear regression did it, we can just compute the mean squared error, which is the basically the difference, the squared difference from the network's prediction and the true target values squared, summing or averaging across the entire training set. This would still work if our network just has a single output. However, our networks now usually have more than one output, so a vector-wise output. In this case, we would just scale this up and also average across the vector. So for each output unit K, we basically compare its predictions with the true target value Y and K, and then yeah, take the square of it yeah, and sum or average across all the different classes as well as the training samples. This is the mean squared error for multiple outputs. And for the example of predicting a bounding box, here we would predict height with x position and y position of the box. And this is basically a vector. So we now have also a vector with the true bounding box that we can compare to, where we compare the x position, the y position, the w, and the h. And this basically gives us our loss. As simple as that. That's mean squared error just scaled to vectorized outputs. Now we can also look at the same in the same way at a classification problem. And there for the simple binary classification of logistic regression, we had the cross entropy loss. And that also scales to more than two classes, which now changes a bit since we are summing over all the classes. But it, what it essentially does is it compares the basically probability 
distribution that our network outputs. So the prediction of our network is basically a normalized vector that basically contains for each class a probability, compares that to the true target values, which is also a vector or can be seen as a vector where we have for each position in the vector, each class, we have a zero or one if this is a true class. So all the positions are zero except for the true target value, which is the position two corresponding to tiger as the label. And that position is one. And we compare those two uh, with our loss function. And since we are basically multiplying the true target values with the log of our network's output, we would then have that only the position where the true target value is one, so the position where it's tiger, where the true class is, is getting maximized or minimized in this case. Now we know how to deal with these two different types of problems. Regression problems, we can compute the mean squared error, or classification problems, we can compute the cross entropy loss. However, both, if you look at this, both losses take an average across the entire training set. This is not something that is practical for modern large data sets because often they cannot even fit into memory. So what do we do? Instead of computing the loss for the entire training set, we compute it for mini batches. So small subsets of the training set that we iterate over and uh, therefore just compute the average on this mini batch and then go to the next mini batch until we once pass through the entire training set and then we repeat that process. Okay, this gives us finally our objective, which can also generalize to more outputs than just one. Okay, and then finally we look at how we can train the model. And there it basically works the same way as we've seen it for linear regression or logistic regression. We can optimize the parameters with just their gradient. However, how do we compute this gradient? It, our networks got a bit more complicated than just these simple linear models. So does it still work the same way? Well, kind of. So for this, we now consider first the network function, which is applied to our input x, each layer its own function, hierarchically stacked on top of each other where the previous layer's output is the new input. And then we finally get a prediction y hat out of the network that is compared through the loss with the true target values. And now we want to look at how we can optimize the parameters of each layer. For this, we need to consider how much the loss is changed by the parameters of a given layer. So how is the gradient of the loss with respect to these parameters? So for the final layer, this is quite simple because we just first compute how much the loss has changed by or is changed by the network's output. That is dl by dy hat. And then we compute how much is the network's output changed by the parameters dy hat by d theta 3. And that's it. Those two together give us finally the gradient of the loss with respect to theta three. And this is the chain rule of derivatives because we can just cross out those two um, dy's and we would end up with the same result again. This is the chain rule and we will apply that throughout computing the derivatives. Can we do the same for the second layer? How much is the loss changed by theta two? Can we find it out in the same way? Let's try it. First, we compute how much the loss is changed by y hat. That's dl dy hat. Then how much the output of the third layer, so the network's output, is changed by the output of the second layer. That's dy hat dh2. Finally, how much is the output of the second layer, dh2, changed by the parameters, d theta2. And this gives us through the chain rule the derivative of the of the network's loss 
with respect to the parameters of the second layer, theta2. And with this principle, we can compute the derivative for any given layer and for all the parameters. And additionally, as you can see here, you actually are also reusing parts of the computation. So for example, dl dy hat was reused in both computations. And that is the case for many of these derivatives. So you don't have to recompute them every time, but we can actually parallelize all of that and do it efficiently. And that is actually key to the success of neural networks to do gradient computation efficiently. And this gives us the gradient, and with the gradient, we can just follow stochastic gradient descent, so gradient descent over many batches, actually, um, to train the model to find the optimal. So, does that mean neural networks just work? Well, often the training graph would look something like that. So epochs means iterations over the entire training set, and the training loss goes down. So fitting the training data often works quite well. That's quite nice. But where is the problem? Well, the problem is related to what we had in the beginning. Our goal is not only to find a model that fits the training data well, but a model that can predict well on new data. And to measure that, we introduce a second set in addition to the training set. It's called the validation set, where we test on unseen data that we don't optimize our parameters on. And good performance there is actually what is most challenging, generalization to unseen data. And this, what we've just seen here, is called overfitting, which is often caused by a model that is too complex, it has too much capacity, such that it can basically memorize the individual data points and then not fit the actual underlying function anymore. And through that, it would not be able to predict here uh, validation points that don't lie exactly where the training data lies. This leads to poor generalization and a curve that looks like that for the validation set. Underfitting is the opposite problem, where we have too little capacity and we cannot really learn anything, not even the training data. So the model cannot fit the training data and has poor performance on both training and validation. That's also not good. A good fit would look, look something like that, where we actually have exactly right capacity and therefore um, can fit the underlying function and therefore do predictions for new unseen data well. And then validation and training loss will somehow align. And this is our goal, finding a good fit. Now, how can we actually prevent overfitting? One solution would be to just stop training as soon as we notice it. We can monitor the validation performance through our training and then stop training before the overfitting starts. Or as soon as we notice overfitting, we stop the training and roll back to a checkpoint where we haven't seen overfitting yet. And another solution would be to add more variations in the input data. So add more data or augment the data a bit if uh, recording new data is too expensive. So here an example of a dog would still be a dog if we rotate or skew the image a bit, we would still expect the network to classify this as a dog. So adding this to the training data would help us to be able to classify more variations of the same images and therefore leads to less overfitting often. Another solution would be to trade off capacity versus training performance. And to do this automatically, we would add an additional term to the loss, which penalizes large weights. So this is just a square of the individual parameter values. And through that, we basically 
and force the weights to be rather small and only few weights actually gain larger values and therefore the model actually has like less capacity. This is something called L2 regularization, which means we add the L2 norm of the parameter vector to our loss. A variation of this is the L1 regularization, where we add the term that penalizes non-zero weights, so the absolute value of our parameters to the loss. And that leads to just individual weights dropping out and then not training those weights anymore after this. And this would lead to more sparse neural networks and therefore um, also reduce the capacity. Now we've seen that often we use the validation set to, for example, determine overfitting and stop the training or select, for example, hyperparameters like learning weight or the parameters of the regularization. And this is maybe not the best to actually evaluate true generalization performance in the end. So therefore we need another test set because if we select certain parameters on the validation set, that means our model is biased towards that data. And therefore, if we report generalization performance, we cannot use that data set anymore. We want to select a different test set that is separate from training and validation data to report the performance in the end. A held out test set reports true generalization performance. So, to summarize everything, we've seen that deep neural networks are just a composition of these simple functions that are individual neurons stacked together to form layers and then layers on top of layers. And this is all built on these simple units that uh, work very, very efficiently together. And then we can first calculate the objective function which scales just to more outputs with cross entropy or mean squared error. We can compute derivatives with respect to the parameters by just decomposing the network function into individual layers and computing the derivatives just for individual layers and then for the parameters themselves. Finally, we use these derivatives to optimize the parameters just as we done before for linear regression or logistic regression. And finally, we can prevent overfitting or re with regularization or early stopping or data augmentation or other methods. Okay, and now it's time to pa pass that on to the real world and apply it to some applications.